All right. So I'm gonna discuss to you about this is a free lecture again for those of you who just came in. This is a free lecture about uh, uh, hemostasis, coagulation, or also known as coagulation, and at the same time the blood thinners. So how can we counteract with your uh, coagulation? All right. I'm gonna draw something like this for a start. Okay. All right. This is. What's this, by the way? Forgive my drawing. So this is like a weighing scale, an old way or an old uh, method of weighing scale, right? So I'm talking about homeostasis here, right? I'm talking about homeostasis. When you say homeostasis, this is about balance, right? This is about balance. When you say about balance, there should be a medium, right? A medium. Since I told you about what, what's, what's our discussion today, it's something about coagulation. So I'm going to put here on this corner, or this uh, uh, portion here, we call it a short coagulation. All right? Coagulation, or also known as, it's more medical when you say it like hemostasis. All right? From the word itself, hemo, that's blood. When you say like stasis, it's not moving, it's not dynamic, it's not circulating, all right? So, and that is because, you know, it involves coagulation, it involves clotting, all right? So, on the other hand, I would write here your anticoagulation, all right? Remember, the first subject in your anatomy and physiology is always, I mean, is homeostasis, it's something about the balance. So there's something like here, this is your medium right here. And what is your medium, by the way, between your coagulation and anticoagulation? All right, again, what's the medium between your coagulation or hemostasis and your anticoagulation? So there's, again, there should be like a balance. If you have coagulation, you also have your anticoagulation. And the medium is what? Is for you to have a good normal blood flow. All right, I'm going to write it here. A normal blood flow, no coagulation, or not even bleeding. All right? So coagulation can happen either physiologically, normally, or coming from a disease or disorder. All right? Coming from a disease or disorder. The blood. Normally, your blood is viscous, right? It's viscous. When you, for example, like in, when you draw blood and then put it in a specimen container on a tube, if it doesn't have heparin on it, it will coagulate because, again, normally your blood is viscous. Normally, it will coagulate. All right? So there should be something like a mechanism, which is an anticoagulation mechanism in your body to make it like smoothly flowing. That's your anticoagulants in your body, which also happens in a normal situation or by giving some medications, right? It's also influenced by your anticoagulants, blood thinners in general. So this is basically your blood thinners that we're going uh, we're gonna discuss about most specifically and more importantly later on, all right? Let's discuss first your coagulation, your hemostasis. Your hemostasis involves two things in order for you to have or to create a clot, all right? So, and what are those things? It involves your primary hemostasis, which in which we're gonna talk about, and as well as your secondary hemostasis. Any questions? Are we good? Okay, and of course, uh, every lectures that I have, I'm always starting it with the foundation. You cannot understand what is or what are blood thinners? What is antiplatelet? What's the action of your antiplatelets, your anticoagulants, your thrombolytics? If you don't understand the foundation about hemostasis, coagulation, at the same time, anticoagulation. Guys, passing NCLEX. Passing NCLEX is not just passing NCLEX. You know what I mean? You have to be a good nurse. You have to pass your NCLEX in order for you to be or to become a good nurse here in the US, Australia, or Canada, wherever it's applicable. You have to meet the standards, all right? So uh, it's challenging, right? It's challenging uh, uh, 
what makes it challenging because you need to know what are the basics you need to know what is really you know what is really NPLEX and what is really becoming a nurse here in the u.s all right that's why i'm saying foundation is always the key if you don't understand the foundation you will not understand also you know the disease processes okay so back in our uh, lecture so uh normally i would write it here i'm sorry so normally right here we have primary hemostasis and as well as your secondary hemostasis your primary hemostasis involves your what involves your platelet okay your secondary hemostasis involves your your coagulation factors all right your coagulation factors okay so your coagulation factors i would also include here uh i would say coagulation factors and that means to say involving your thrombin and as well as your uh, fibrin so i would say here coagulation factors which involves the two main thing which is your thrombin at the same time your fibrin okay so we have three things here huh your platelet your thrombin at the same time your fibrin your pri uh, your primary hemostasis involves your platelet your secondary hemostasis involves your coagulation factors your thrombin and your fibrin guys your thrombin is basically what your thrombin is water soluble i'm gonna make it green and your fibrin is non-water soluble okay it's non-water soluble so what does it mean when you say like non-water soluble when the fibrin is made it's actually a mesh all right when the fibrin is made it means to say it's already stabilized. The clot is already stabilized. It's non-soluble. Okay, so there must be something like a mechanism to break down your fibrin because this is very sticky, you know, that makes your clot stabilized and cemented in your blood vessel. All right, so this is your primary and your secondary hemostasis. I'm going to draw uh, that. I'm going to emphasize more on that in my drawing. And... In the presence of disease or disorder, give me an example of your disorder that causes clot formation or that causes hemostasis. Come on, guys. Uh, I will I'll have to look at your chat room here. So give me some examples, most common examples or conditions that causes you to have hemostasis. Come on. I'll make it in red. Okay. This is a very NCLEX thing, huh? It's a very NCLEX thing. And of course, if it comes out in your NCLEX, definitely, of course, it's always consistent with what you see in the hospitals. By the way, I'm working in a medical surgical telemetry. And I can really see, you know, what's really going on in there. It's a very active floor. And it's very, very consistent with what's really going on, what's really coming out in your NCLEX. Hemophilia, it's something about bleeding. TVT, very good. So I would say like VTE, your venous thromboembolism, collectively known as your VTE, which means that's your DVT at the same time, your pulmonary embolism. Your pulmonary embolism is actually caused by your uh, deep vein thrombosis. Again, like I said, it's collectively known as your venous thromboembolism. Guys, we're still talking about hemostasis here. All right. When you say like hemostasis, again, hemo means blood. Stasis means the blood is not moving because, you know, it involves coagulation, all right? And that includes your primary and your secondary hemostasis. Give me other conditions, guys. Give me other conditions. DVT and I would say like uh, coronary artery disease in which if you don't take care of it, it will lead into your acute coronary syndrome. Your acute coronary syndrome comes in two forms, your acute myocardial infarction, that's basically your acute myocardial infarction, sorry. So that comes with two uh, classification, your non-STEMI and as well as your ST elevation in which we don't like it, right? Because the damage is uh, more like, you know, as compared to your non-STEMI. We're not going to talk about MI here or uh, ACS. This is basically your MI, all right? 
All right, so what else? We also have your CVA, all right? Your stroke, specifically of your ischemic type. All right, specifically of your ischemic type. Give me some more. Uh, you told me about uh, DVT. Give me some more. Let's just say your arterial stenosis as well. Arterial. Uh, your arterial stenosis. Uh, let's just say in uh, collectively as your peripheral arterial disease. All right, peripheral arterial diseases. Or let's just say venous insufficiency. All right. These conditions, these are the, just the example of your conditions that causes hemostasis, all right? More importantly, which is always coming out in your NCLEX, your DVT, your pulmonary embolism, collectively known as your VTE, your acute coronary syndrome, your CBA as well, your PADs, peripheral arterial diseases, and some of the venous insufficiency disorders, all right? Which again causes coagulation or hemostasis. All right, it's either normally because your blood is natural viscous or it's either influenced by a disease or a disorder. I've mentioned it already. Okay, so there should be a balance, right? There should be a balance. In a normal situation, there's always like an anticoagulation. That's why your blood runs smoothly in your blood vessels. Again, the medium is your normal blood flow. Did you understand? All right. In uh, another situation, which is influenced by medication, we have your blood thinners. Your blood thinners, I would classify it into three according to its, uh, of course, when you give like blood thinners, it's always like bleeding, right? So it's always like bleeding, all right? It's always like bleeding. Again, this is an anticoagulation mechanism. It's influenced by your medic medication or in a normal situation or a normal physiologic response if you have a uh, coagulation we have your bleeding right so i will categorize it like i said according to its bleeding risk we're gonna discuss uh, later on about your antiplatelet all right so antiplatelet in other words this involves your primary hemostasis all right the risk here is mild mild risk for bleeding all right and the other one is your anticoagulants. Anticoagulants. Okay. This involves your secondary hemostasis. All right. And the risk here is moderate risk. All right. So these are the risks. Huh? The mild risk for your antiplatelet, mild risk for bleeding, for anticoagulants, which involves your secondary hemostasis, your coagulation factors, which is moderate risk. And lastly, your fibrinolytics okay your fibrinolytics which also involves your secondary hemostasis specifically to your fibrin all right we already discussed about fibrin a little bit right your fibrin is non-water soluble you need to have a stronger anticoagulants right not really anticoagulants a stronger medication which is your fibrinolytics or also known as your thrombolytics okay so uh hold on let me just uh exit this one all right and the risk here for bleeding is severe so we classify it according to being mild being moderate and severe risk in your bleeding your antiplatelet is mild risk for bleeding but again huh there's always like a bleeding right there's always like a bleeding in terms of risk anticoagulants moderate risk for bleeding and finally, your fibrinolytics, the strongest of them all. If it's the strongest, if it's the most potent, that means to say that you have high risk for developing, you know, this severe risk of bleeding in terms of its category. All right? Because it involves already your fibrin. We're going to give examples later on. Okay? So let me review your homeostasis here. Your balance between your coagulation and at the same time your anticoagulation. Before anything else, I forgot. It's always my norm to say something like a words of wisdom to you guys. You came into this journey, right? I'm going to start it with, uh, I would uh, say like three words for you to, to carry or to, for, for, you know, a takeaway words before we will end this discussion later on. Okay? I'm going to start it first with one word. Listen, guys. 
I'm not gonna end up this, uh, you know, this discussion if I don't have any words of wisdom. Number one word is inspiration. All right, number one word is inspiration. Just a little pause on our lecture. We've uh, we've done your balance or homeostasis already between your coagulation and your anticoagulation. I'm just gonna review it uh, in a little moment. Okay, so I would give you the first word, which is inspiration. All right, for what? You always have to be motivated, whatever inspiration that you have. It will always propel you to success. All right. Whenever you are tired, for example, in your review during the process, I would recommend like six months. Three months is too early. You have to double time. All right. The ideal way, the, the ideal time frame is usually six months. Okay. Whenever you get tired, that's that's a lot. All right. Whenever you get tired in the middle of your uh, of your journey while preparing your NCLEX, you always think about your inspiration. You always think about why did you take this examination? So that will propel you to your success. All right? That's the first word that I'm going to say. In the middle or along the way, I'm going to give you the second one. And the third one would be, you know, before we end our discussion today. Does that make sense? Inspiration. You always have to have a motivation. Why did you take this NCLEX? Like I said, whenever you get tired, look back. Why did you take this examination? Again, that will bring you to your success later on. Let's go back to your balance here. So uh, between coagulation and your anticoagulation, coagulation means hemostasis, all right? In order for you to have or to, to, to meet the balance, which is normal blood flow, your body needs to, for example, if you have coagulation, your body needs to produce anticoagulants. In a disease or a disorder wherein you can also develop coagulation basing on what I discussed, like BTE, CAD, CBA, PAD, and some venous insufficiencies because of a certain clot. In that particular disorder, you need to have it's overwhelming. You need to have medications which, you know, balances out the situation. And that's what we call as your blood thinners. Your blood thinners are classified into three. I would classify it according to its risk for bleeding. Number one is mild risk for bleeding, which is your antiplatelet primarily, which involves your primary hemostasis. That's your platelet. All right. And your anticoagulants, which involves your secondary hemostasis. All right. It's moderate, moderate risk for bleeding. And lastly, your fibrinolytics, which also involves your secondary hemostasis, which specifically, you know, uh, uh, pertaining to your fibrin. And that is high risk for severe risk for bleeding. Okay, so that's how we're going to, uh, to categorize that. Later on, I'm going to give you the medication specifically, all right, because that's the bulk of your topic for today. And that's basically your NCLEX. Let me bring you to this drawing, all right? Let me bring you to this drawing. So, to better emphasize what's really going on if you have clotting, all right? So this is your play. If you have some form of, like I said, in a normal situation, even in a normal situation, your blood is normally or naturally viscous, it will create clotting mechanism, right? How much more if you have injury? And your blood vessels, this is your blood vessels, by the way. All right. This is your blood vessel. In the inner portion, we call it as your endothelium, right? Your endothelium from the word itself, endo means within all right so this is subject for wear and tear so at any time you always have you know you anticipate injury to that blood vessel and how much more if you have some form of a disorder okay so let's just say this is injured this is injured all right so if this is injured or traumatized because of for example like wear and tear without even a presence of your you know without even a presence of your disorders because of wear and tear, platelet arrives, right? Your platelet. So what is platelet again? Is it primary hemostasis or secondary hemostasis? That is basically your platelet, all right? Which is your primary hemostasis, all right? They will adhere to the area. What's the different difference between your adhesion and aggregation? Guys, What's the difference between your aggregation and as well as adhesion? 
Can anyone uh, tell me what's the difference between your adhesion and aggregation? This is very important. This is very basic. Okay. Watching live from Ghana as well. All right. A burger's disease can, uh, for instance, yeah, can, can also cause some co forms of coagulation. All right. What else? <clears throat> All right. Uh, what did I uh, tell you? What's the difference between your adhesion and aggregation? Adhesion is primarily platelet going to the area, sticking to the area. The first platelets that will arrive to the area. That's basically your platelet adhesion. All right. If these platelets will invite more platelets to arrive in the area, that's what we call platelet aggregation. All right. So again, platelet adhesion is the first few platelets that will arrive to the area. Okay. And the next few, I mean, the next platelets that will go to the area or that will stick to the area we call them as your platelet aggregation they will aggregate to each other so one platelet to another platelet to another platelet those are what we call as your platelet aggregation anyway this is your primary hemostasis which involves your platelet okay so at this time on you know where i'm talking here so there should be a certain medication to you know to prevent platelet from coming in or platelet from adhering or uh, from, uh, you know, from aggregating. All right, that's your platelet. Now, the second thing, second thing is your what? The second thing are your coagulation cascade. All right, which is again, which involves your coagulation cascade or coagulation factor, sorry. So the green ones, I would make it bigger, but they are actually small, all right? This is what we call as your coagulation cascade, all right? When you say like cascade, it's a series of events. Again, this is your secondary hemostasis involving your what? Your coagulation, your coagulation factors, your coagulation factors. I'm going to draw something like this, okay? <clears throat> I'm going to draw something like, uh, let's make it uh, black. I'm going to draw something like this. There you go. Okay. Your coagulation factors, by the way, your coagulation factors is made up of three pathways. I'm going to put it here, intrinsic. And this one here is your extrinsic pathway. All right. So this is intrinsic pathway and extrinsic pathway. And in the middle, we call it as your common pathway. All right. So I'm discussing to you guys what is coagulation cascade. All right. Before I go to that, let me move on to my drawing here. And the last one would be what? The last one would be your fibrin, right? The last byproduct will be your fibrin. Your fibrin actually, what? Again, like I said earlier, stabilizes your clots. And it's non-water soluble. Let's go back to this. To these pathways the intrinsic pathway the extrinsic pathway and the common pathway again it involves coagulation factors the coagulation factors that involves here are what factors 12 11 9 and 8 in your intrinsic pathway in your extrinsic pathway the involved clotting factors are 3 and 7 okay 3 and 7 in your common pathway so this is one, this is second, and this is third. They will meet in the common pathway, by the way. So this is 10, this is five, this is clotting factors number two and clotting factors number one. When you say clotting factors number two, it involves your thrombin. What is your thrombin again? Thrombin is water soluble. And clotting factor number one, it involves your fibrin which is basically what non-water soluble so coming from an intrinsic pathway and extrinsic pathway it will develop to form a fibrin that is your coagulation cascade by the way let's take a look at other uh, uh, measures here or other parameters that you need to remember your uh, let's make it red your factor 7 your factor 10 
your factor 2, even your factor 9 are de dependent to your vitamin K. If you don't produce or synthesize your vitamin K, this factor 7, 9, 10, and 2 is not going to happen again without the presence of your vitamin K. So I'm going to put an arrow on it. Okay? So vitamin K, again, has a role in your clotting mechanism. Okay? Vitamin K has a role in your clotting mechanism. All right? We measure the time in your intrinsic pathway before it goes to your, you know, uh, to your common pathway. So we measure here. What do we measure here? We measure your your partial thromboplastin time, right? Your partial thromboplastin time. The normal time of your partial thromboplastin is about 25 to 35 seconds, okay? And also in your extrinsic pathway, we also measure your PT and as well as your INR, okay? Your PT as well as your INR. Your INR, don't, I mean, forget about your PT. Think about your INR. It's the calculated pro, uh, prothrombin time already, okay? Your INR is about 0 0.9 to 1.18 without any, again, huh, without any influences of your medications, without any influence of your warfarin, for example. Your warfarin works here. By the way, your warfarin works here, okay? And your heparin also works here. That's why you measure your PTT, warfarin. You measure your INR, okay? Anyway, back to here. Intrinsic, extrinsic pathway, just to, you know, just to uh, summarize it. We have clotting factors involved here. 7, 9, 10, and 2 is dependent to your vitamin K. That's your target. And the byproduct is your fibrin. Okay? The byproduct is your fibrin. And we don't want fibrin to develop because, again, it's non-water soluble. It will stabilize your clot. So that's your clotting formation. All right? That's your clotting formation. Let me draw here versus, okay? There should be a normal mechanism. There should be certain things that needs to balance the clotting in order for you to have a good, good you know, uh, blood flow. That's your medium, right? Basing on what I discussed earlier. So I'm going to put here something like, uh, these are the chemicals involved here. I'm going to write here. Let's just uh, make it red all right is it really showing yeah i guess so so this is your it's letter h that's a heparin molecule all right that's a heparin molecule your heparin molecule binds to a specific kind of protein which is what we call as your antithrombin the green one is what we call as your antithrombin all right the green one is an antithrombin which means Antithrombin is anti-clotting factors number two, all right? So it's against your clotting factors number two. Later on, when I discuss the medications, I would relate it to my drawing, all right? I would relate it to my drawing. There's another chemical here. Actually, it's a complex chemical, all right? It's a complex mechanism wherein you have, I'm going to draw something like this. And it binds to a specific, I'm going to make it black this time. There you go. All right. This is what we call as your thrombomodulin. All right. This is what we call as your thrombomodulin. Thrombomodulin. Uh, complex. All right. Thrombomodulin complex. From the word itself, thrombo. It will modulate. Modulin means what? It's a protein that modulates your thrombin, specifically your thrombin, all right? By, uh, by some other proteins like your protein C and your protein S as well. So there are two proteins involved here, protein S and as well as your protein C. So that's why it's called complex. Your protein C and your protein S together with your thrombomodulin will actually deactivate your thrombin. All right? Will deactivate your thrombin. And lastly, I'm going to make it green again. And lastly, we have your... <clears throat> this is a protein which is a shortcut. I'm just going to make it shortcut. All right? So this is a complex kind of mechanism. I will say that this is your plasmin. 
all right? Your plasmin. Your plasmin actually is a broken down plasminogen. When you break down your plasminogen, you will create your plasmin, right? Remember, plasminogen. When you say like gen, these are complex, you know, these are complex protein. When you break them down, it will form plasmin specifically. When you break down your plasminogen coming from your liver, it will create plasmin. Okay? And there should be a certain protein or a certain enzyme, not an enzyme, it's a polypeptide, if I'm not mistaken. We call it as your tissue plasminogen. This is not a shortcut anymore. <laughs> I'm, I'm already discussing this one. So we call them as your TPA. Normally, your body produces TPA. Your TPA is a tissue plasminogen activator. In other words, it will break down your plasmin, I mean your plasminogen, to form plasmin. Your plasmin works with your fibrin. So it will fight your fibrin. Again, plasmin fights your fibrin. So it's an anti-fibrin kind of you know, uh, chemical. It's a fibrinolytic. It will break down your fibrin. The byproduct between the two of them is what we call as your D-dimer. That's why, have you heard about D-dimer, guys? Have you heard about D-dimer? When you say D-dimer, when your D-dimer is elevated, the normal value is 500 or less than 500. If it's more than 500, that means to say you are developing clots, all right? Again, if your D-dimer is elevated, that means to say that your body is producing tissue plasminogen activator to, again, to break down your plasminogen to form plasmin because your body is producing lots of fibrin. That's an indication, again, that your body is forming clots. D-dimer can be increased in the presence of your pulmonary embolism, for instance, as what I mentioned earlier. All right? So this is the balance, guys. If you have clot formation here, if we have clot formed here, we also have certain mechanisms that will, you know, break down your clots by again by producing antithrombin together with your heparin molecule, they will bind together to enhance anticoagulation activity. We also have your protein C, protein S, your thrombomodulin, it's a protein which will also break down your clots specifically your thrombin, and the words of thrombomodulin. Can you still follow? Are you still with me, guys? It will modulate your thrombin. Hey, I'm going to deactivate you. And lastly, we also have your tissue plasminogen activator, will, which will break down your plasminogen to form plasmin because plasmin is anti-fibrin. Their byproducts, when the plasmin and fibrin fighting together, their byproducts is what we call a short D-dimer. And some other byproducts, which is collectively known as your fibrin degradation products. I'm not going to mention anything about that. One of them is your D-dimer, which is very sensitive to your blood draws. I mean, to your, you know, to your uh, serum, right? So anyway, this is your mechanism. Why did I discuss this? Why did I discuss this? Because this is the target of your pharmacology. This is the target of your antiplatelets the targets of your anticoagulants in terms of its mode of action and the targets of your your fibrinolytics all right so did you understand this are we good so let's move on to your medications let's move on to your medications guys any questions thank you mr uh, oduro you're uh, uh, you're coming from where all right so mr ah mr ervin uh, she's he's from uh He's from uh, Niners. Hello, sir. How are you doing? Again, huh? This is, I, I, I really love this, you know, this platform of Connetics. This is Connetics College in coordination with other review centers like uh, Aspire, Niners, and Swoosh. So, guys, I really thank you guys for helping us, you know, at least to become instruments of these people's uh, success. And I'm really happy about it, right? So, anyway, always watch to refresh memory. Yes, this is really refreshing, right? You know what? Review is not just review. There are many things back in college that we're not able to reconcile in terms of did you understand it really well or not? 
All right. There are many discussions to college that we not we're not able to understand because probably lack of time. All right. So uh, so like I said, for example, in IPAS, as much as possible, I will really discuss about the foundation. There are many you know discussions in college that we're not able to reconcile, and it's very important. So it's not really a review after all. That's why I call it academy, because uh, you know as much as possible, everything is there. You know, so, uh, you know, we'll have to give as much as we can. All right. So let's go back to your medications, to your medications. All right. So we have three classifications of your medications according to risk. All right. So mild risk, moderate risk, and severe risk for bleeding. All right. All of the blood thinners causes bleeding. Antiplatelet causes what? Antiplatelet causes mild risk for bleeding all right so antiplatelets give me an examples of your antiplatelets I, i'm just gonna make it green i would say the examples we have what <clears throat> come on come on guys come on so what are the what are the examples of your antiplatelets most commonly what most commonly what a very famous medication now we're discussing about your blood thinners this is a kind, kind of fast you know uh, discussion aspirin very good your aspirin the famous aspirin it's an antiplatelet medication at the same time at the same time a a uh, a blood thinner I, I mean it's an antiplatelet at the same time an NSAIDs right so let's go back here i think i forgot something here in order for you to prevent platelet we also have some chemicals all right we also have some chemicals which is what we call as your nitric oxide i forgot about this we're not done yet. We have nitric oxide. It's just too much, right? Uh, we have nitric oxide at the same time, your uh, your prostacycline. Your prostacycline. Your prostacycline from the word itself, prosta. Prostaglandin. It's something about inflammatory response. All right? Prostacycline. Your prostacycline, your nitric oxide are antiplatelets. All right. Again, your nitric oxide and your prostacycline are antiplatelet chemicals that is normally produced in your body. Now, let's go back to your aspirin. Your aspirin activates that certain mechanism in order for it to prevent your platelet from coming, from adhering at the same time from aggregating. That's your aspirin. Give me something else, guys. Heparin is an anticoag, right? So antiplatelet, those are two different things. Antiplatelets, your aspirin. The other one would be what? The other one would be your clopidogrel. All right, your clopidogrel. Give me something else. The other one would be uh, prasugrel. Prasugrel. Okay. And the other one would be like a grelor. All right, your aspirin, clopidogrel, and your uh, prasugrel, and your ticregulor. <laughs> I cannot pronounce it really well. I'm still having a hard time in pronouncing or saying it. These are antiplatelet medication. Your aspirin specifically acts to your uh, to your blood vessel in terms of preventing your prostacycline cycle, okay, or mechanism. All right, so your prostacycline cycle is also found in your uh, inflammatory response. So in other words, it's an antiplatelet, you know, kind of medication. At the same time, it's an anti-inflammatory kind of medication, right? Your clopidogrel and your prasugrel is actually the mode of action. Let's just write it in red, all right? The mode of action of your aspirin is to stimulate, I mean, to, uh, I mean, preventing your platelet, basically. And your clopidogrel, prasugrel, and your ticagrelor is actually an anti-ADP. An ADP is a chemical which is produced by platelets. An ADP, again, is a chemical that is produced by platelets. Uh, what happens if you produce this ADP? It will promote platelet aggregation. Hey, if I'm the platelet, I'm going to produce ADP. I'm going to produce ADP to invite more platelet to adhere, I mean, to aggregate to the area. Okay, again, your platelet is able to produce certain chemicals like your ADP to invite more platelets. All right, so that's the work of your clopidogrel, your prasugrel, and your tacagrelor. 
Your aspirin is more onto your prostacycline cycle. All right? That's the mode of action specifically. Okay. By the way, when you say antiplatelet, this is also a common, you know, question in your NPLEX. Ping! It will, you know, it will, it will alarm to your mind when you say like, ah, it will come out in your NPLEX. Please take note and remember that. Antiplatelet is... Uh, the, the the primary you know uh, reason why you give platelet is to prevent further clots okay this is to prevent further clots specifically of your platelet because again platelets involved in your hemostasis all right so your aspirin your copidogrel pasogrel and your tecagrelor so the nursing responsibility again this is something to do with your nplex so I already wrote it down so not to consume time. Please monitor the platelet. What's the normal platelet count? The normal platelet count is 150,000 to 400,000. Okay? That's remember this is an antiplatelet. You monitor for the platelet count. Okay? If it's less than 50,000, you have to hold the medication. Inform the physician and then hold the medication. Inform HCP. Or if the doctor will order antiplatelet without looking at the platelet count, please question the order. Did you understand? Again, please question the order if the value of your platelet is less than 50,000. Okay? Less than 50,000, again, hold, inform the physician or question the physician if it's, you know, if he or she is about to order an antiplatelet. How about your hemoglobin? Our magic number here is not less than seven. If it's less than seven, your patient is high risk for, you know, there must be something going on. All right. Your patient is high risk for bleeding. At the same time, you're giving an anti, you know, an anti uh, platelet medication. You're just putting your patient into high risk for bleeding. All right. So the magic number there is seven. Please do not give the medication if your hemoglobin is 7. H and H means hemoglobin and hematocrit, your hemoglobin, right? So what's the antidote? Uh, this is uh, platelet, uh, aspirin. What's the antidote of aspirin, by the way? So uh, what's the antidote of aspirin, by the way? So anyway, so I'm just uh, going to skip this one. More importantly, we're going to have an antidote uh, discussion about your anticoags at the same time your your fibrinolytics I would say right so anyway so <clears throat> this is your platelets so what did you monitor guys you monitor for your platelet at the same time your hemoglobin what about your toxicity all right what about your toxicity aspirin toxicity this is also a common question right your aspirin toxicity your aspirin toxicity is uh, a very common thing which is characterized by what? Characterized by tinnitus. All right? That's a sign, huh? This is an NCLEX tip. So they usually ask about tinnitus. Again, related to your aspirin toxicity because it's autotoxic. Aspirin is basically autotoxic. All right? So in here, uh, what we do is, this is what I'm talking about. So there's, after all, there should be, you know, there's an antidote. There's always an antidote for everything, right? So in, including, you know, everything. So there's always like a balance. If you remember that I started my lecture about balance, right? So there's always like a balance. So there should be like an antidote if you have aspirin toxicity. I would say NCLEX is always asking about activated charcoal. All right? Take note, huh? Activated charcoal. This is the one that you give if you have aspirin toxicity. You answer that activated charcoal. And what else? Other thing other than tinnitus, which is a very common thing, is your respiratory alkalosis, which clinically you can see your patient that is, you know, hyperventilating. So I would write here hyperventilating, hyperventilation. There we go. Your patient will hyperventilate respiratory alkalosis in your blood gases and as well as tinnitus. Again, if you have aspirin toxicity, what are you going to give? activated charcoal all right and of course you have to monitor the bleeding signs monitor the bleeding signs we're going to discuss to you about the bleeding signs you know from head to toe the most common you know bleeding signs that you can see from your patient 
Okay, let's move on to your anti-coags. Your anti-coags, in general, just like your anti-platelets, it will prevent what? It will prevent, I'm going to write it here at the side. It will prevent, this is also a common NCLEX thing. It's an NCLEX tip. Prevent the size of the existing, prevent the size of the existing uh, clots. At the same time, it will also prevent further clots, just like your platelets, antiplatelets, sorry. Again, anticoags will prevent the size, the existing size of your clots, of the existing clots at the same time, prevent further coagulation cascade. And that is uh, your heparin. Your heparin is, this is what you're uh, telling me earlier, all right? So your heparin. Your heparin is an anticoag. That is not an antiplatelet. Those are two different things. When you say heparin, we have two types of your heparin. Your unfractionated and your low molecular heparin. Your unfractionated is the IV form in a form of a drip. That's how you administer it. Your low molecular weight heparin in a form of sub-Q. That's the route of administration. This is a very, very you know, a common uh, topic in your NCLEX. In fact, this is the bulk of your blood thinners in terms of you know what they ask. All right, what, what are the examples of your low molecular weight heparin? Okay, so I would say you're unfractionated in terms of its mode of action, huh? Before I'll proceed with the examples. Your unfractionated is actually, let me write here. The mode of action is specific to your what? Specific to your uh Factor 2 and factor 10 as well. Clotting factors number 2 and clotting factors number 10. So here, they are actually called as your direct acting, direct acting oral anticoagulants. Direct acting oral or direct acting, let's just say uh, direct acting anticoags. All right, which means to say it will directly act to your clotting factors. For example, clotting factor number two and clotting factor number 10. I guess we're having a good time here. It's already almost eight, right? So this is a big topic, by the way. Now, let me just make it like, let, can I extend a little bit? Can we extend a little bit of uh, time? I guess for like 30 minutes, that'll be fine, right? So I guess that this topic is really good. I would say this topic is really good, right? So this will uh, help you. So your uh, low molecular weight heparin is actually specific to your clotting factors number 10. Okay? Specific to your clotting factors number 10. So what are the examples of your low molecular weight heparin? So I'm going to make it... Uh, where is my pen? I'm going to make it uh, green. That's your enoxaparin. All right? Your enoxaparin. Your noxaparin, what else? Your fundaparinox. All right. This is a newer version of your enoxaparin, fundaparinox. All right. If you notice, if you notice enoxaparin, XA, and as well as X here. Enoxaparin and your fundaparinox. X means what? 10. Clotting factors number 10. Specific to your clotting factors number 10. All right, that's your enoxaparin and as well as your fundaparinox. Enoxaparin, the problem in enoxaparin is that it's high risk for developing your, your what? Your heparin-induced thrombocytopenia, all right? So higher risk in developing your uh, heparin-induced thrombocytopenia. Your fundaparinox is lesser risk of developing HIT. I would put an arrow on it, okay? That's your heparin, unfractionated, that's your IV drip. Your low molecular weight heparin, so that's specific to your clotting factors number 10. Your unfractionated is specific to your not only your 10, but as well as your clotting factors number 2. You already understood, you know, what the clotting mechanism is, right? And your enoxaparin are the examples of your low molecular sub-Q and fundaparinox, all right? So enoxaparin is lesser chances of uh, heparin-induced thrombocytopenia. Your fundaparinox is lesser, I mean, oxaparin is higher chances of hit. Fundaparinox is lesser chances of your hit. Okay. 
So let me move on to your nursing uh, uh, care related to your anticoag, specifically of your heparin. Of course, you need to check for the signs and symptoms of your bleeding. Check for your platelet as well. Again, our parameter here is if it's less than 50,000, or let's just say if uh, the platelet is 50% less of the baseline. If your platelet is, for example, 300,000, it went down to 150,000. So that could be hits. Heparin induced thrombocytopenia. Specifically, for example, your unfractionated and as well as your inoxaparin. For fundaparinox, lesser, lesser chances of your hits. Okay. And of course, your H and H, your hemoglobin count of less than seven, you need to inform the doctor. And you have to understand that this is to be measured, your PTT. Your magic number here from the word itself, I mean, yeah, from, 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 from the word itself, your PTT, always remember, it looks like letter H. That's why you have to monitor that. Okay. And your PTT is to be measured only for your unfractionated. All right. Your unfractionated. You don't measure it in your what in your sub q i will put here iv fractionated so your ptt again ptt it looks like letter h so that's how you measure it <clears throat> and so uh your ptt is uh, the magic number here that you need to remember please do not exceed more than 70 seconds again huh more than 70 seconds more than 70 seconds is already as I mean, high risk for bleeding, more than 70 seconds. This is already high risk for bleeding. I'm going to highlight this one. Again, if it's more than 70 seconds, that's the magic number. It has to be less than that, therapeutic, all right? If it's more than 70 seconds, your patient is high risk for bleeding. Did you understand? What's the antidote for your uh, heparin toxicity? What's the antidote for your heparin toxicity? The antidote for your heparin toxicity is what? your protamine sulfate, all right? This is also a common thing, right? Your heparin, uh, I mean your heparin, your protamine sulfate. Remember, this is heparin. If you look at the mode of action, look at the drawing here. So it basically binds to your antithrombin. So heparin is an antithrombin. Let me add it here. So heparin is an antithrombin. I'm going to make it red. It's an antithrombin enhancer, right? So it's an antithrombin enhancer. It enhances your antithrombin activity. It will bind to your antithrombin so that it will deactivate your thrombin, specifically to your thrombin. Going back to your nursing interventions, no, please. When you do your subcutaneous, huh? this is also NCLEX. When you do your subcutaneous injection, please do not massage. All right, do not massage or do not rub, please. No massage to the side and no rubbing to the side. And another question which is common to subcutaneous, you know, heparin or low molecular weight heparin, please do not aspirate, all right? Just leave it as is and then inject it to your patient. Another thing, another question related to this low molecular weight heparin, specifically of your fundaparinox, I'm going to write here subcutaneous fundaparinox. Fundaparinox. Your fundaparinox is withheld for a patient having spinal anesthesia. All right? For a patient having spinal anesthesia. A patient having spinal anesthesia, you should hold blood thinners in general, and most specifically your fundaparinox, <clears throat> within six hours post op. All right, the magic number there is six hours. So within six hours of your uh, post-op status, please, no blood thinners. You can only give blood thinners, especially if your patient's having spinal anesthesia, an epidural catheter, only after six hours. And special mention to your fundaparinox. Again, a low molecular weight kind of heparin, okay? So hold within six hours after uh, surgery, especially if your patient is with spinal anesthesia and epidural catheter is inserted there for fundaparinox special mention. 
I'm always repeating that so you will remember it. Okay. So next up, we have your warframe. Your warframe. Okay. Your warframe is the PO form, right? This is the PO form of your heparin, basically. All right. So PO form of your uh, heparin. So your warframe is the mode of action is this is an anti-vitamin K. So anti-vitamin K. In other words, it's a vitamin K inhibitor. All right. It's a vitamin K. I'm having a hard time writing it because it's looking like uh, it's hanging a little bit. Inhibitor. There you go. It's an anti-vitamin K or an inhibitor to your vitamin K. That's the work of your warframe. So what do you need to monitor? Of course, the signs of bleeding. All right. And you also monitor the INR. Okay, the INR. The INR should be what? The INR should be not more than 3 to 5 seconds. Don't forget, that's the magic figure here. If it's more than 3 to 5 seconds, again, if it's more than 3 to 5 seconds, patient is high risk for bleeding. All right? The patient is high risk for bleeding. You might hold that medication. H and H. Again, hemoglobin is not less than 7. That's the magic figure here in your NCLEX. No need for platelet. Huh? No need for platelet. Uh, uh, checking. You don't need that. It's only for your what? It's only for your heparin because heparin can induce your heparin. I mean, heparin induce thrombocytopenia. So no need for platelets uh, checking. What's the antidote for your warfarin? What's the antidote for your warfarin? What's the antidote for your warfarin, uh, guys? Vitamin K. All right. Your vitamin K. Because they fight each other, right? So they are, you know, they are protagonists. They are counteracting to each other. So antidote is vitamin K. Common questions related to your warfarin related to vitamin K specifically. Question. Where do you get uh, abundant, you know, vitamin K? From a green leafy vegetables, right? From a green leafy vegetables. Green leafy vegetables. Okay. From a green leafy vegetables, do you need to increase the green leafy vegetables or lower the amounts of green leafy vegetables intake? No. You just have to be consistent. All right? You just have to be consistent. Again, green leafy vegetables, you just have to be consistent in terms of intake. You don't need to lower your intake or increase your intake of your green leafy vegetables. Okay? Just have to be consistent. Another thing is that your antibiotics. Your antibiotics, does that affect your, your, your uh, vitamin K? Yes, it affects your vitamin K. It affects your warfarin. Because antibiotics, remember, antibiotics doesn't only kill the microorganism at the same time. It also kills the microorganisms inside your colon. All right? The, the colonic microorganisms there is actually or can synthesize your vitamin K. So whenever you give your antibiotics to your patient, again, it will affect your vitamin K. Eventually, it will affect your warfarin. Did you get that? So that's your vitamin K. These are the things that you need to remember related to your vitamin K in relation to your warfarin, okay? So again, for your antidote, vitamin K, you just have to be consistent. That's your warfarin, huh? That's your warfarin. Let's move on to your uh, other anticoags. Your other anticoags. I'm having really hard time, you know, in terms of uh, to 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 um, maximize my 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 lecture in a minimized time. So I would say uh, there are the mode of action of these anticoags is again the same thing. It's a direct acting oral anticoags. For example, we have your argatroban. All right, your ergatroban. The other thing is your bivalirudin. Bivalirudin. This is a lot, guys. And the other one would be your your dibig, uh, dibigatran. These are very common to your NCLEX. All right, I'm going to write it again. The bigatran. There you go. Ergatroban and your bivalirudin. These are your IV form. And your dibigatran is your PO. Okay, so they directly act to your what's 
to your clotting factors number two. All right. On the other hand, we have the famous apixaban. We have the famous your uh, ribaroxaban. All right. And lastly, your edoxaban. Wow. This is basically your what? Pharmacology. So it's kind of hard. All right. But it's doable. Apixaban is PO. Everything is like PO here. And your edoxaban is also PO. Okay. This is from the word itself, apixa, sa, ribaroxa, edoxa, clotting factors number 10. Clotting factors number 10. X. Actually, it's a cofactor, which is, you know, your XA. So clotting factor 10, right? So for ergatroban, vibilirudin, and the bigotran, it's clotting factors number 2. Pixaban, ribaroxaban, edoxaban are for PO. These are alternates for your what? Alternates for your warfarin. All right? So this is an alternative to your warfarin. And when you say like argatroban, bibilirudin, or the bigatran, these are alternates to your heparin. For some reason, for example, like your patient is allergic, you know, to your heparin. You do your argatroban. You give your argatroban, bibilirudin, and your the bigatran as well. Okay. The good thing about your apixaban, the baroxaban, edoxaban, alternates to your warfarin, you don't need much of coagulation laboratories. All right? So warfarin, by the way, is very good in patients with what? With ESRD, don't forget, and as well as with valvular problems or valvular disease. Okay? With valvular disease. Again, with ESRD at the same time with valve disease. Let me move on. So again, your apixaban in relation to your warfarin, this is not given to a patient having ESRD. And this is not also good for a patient having valvular disease. In other words, you give warfarin instead. The bad thing about warfarin because there's there's so many blood works. On the other hand, when you say like apixaban, rivaroxaban, which has a lower risk of bleeding, all right? No need for uh, uh, coags laboratories. You just have to check for check for BUN and creatinine because this medication is or can cause kidney problems as well. All right. So check for uh, it's written here already your BUN and creatinine. You also check for your hemoglobin. You say like you know the magic number is seven, and it's not combined with heparin. Huh? Don't forget, it's not combined with your heparin because it's a very strong medication. All right. So let's go to your thrombolytics, guys. Your thrombolytics, if your heparin, if your anticoagulants, your antiplatelet prevent clots, all right? Prevent clots. Okay. Your thrombolytics dissolve clots. So it's a clot buster. It will dissolve clots. Okay. Dissolves clots. So this is a strong kind of medication, thrombolytics. The examples of these medications are what? Your alteplase. All right, your alteplase can be given IV in an hour. All right, IV in an hour or catheter assisted. Or catheter assisted. When you say catheter assisted, you're going to insert it to your, for example, to your groin, and you will give the medication. It can stay there, you know, it can stay there up to 72 hours. So your patient is high risk for bleeding for about three days. But usually the clot will dissolve about 24 hours. All right. So it's either IV or catheter assisted uh, kind of thrombo thrombolysis. That's your alteplase, guys. This is a very strong medication. Please, the nursing intervention here is what? No IV, no extra IV, no IMs, no sub Q, no ABGs, no arterial blood gas monitoring. Because again, your patient is high risk for bleeding. All right. It's not given through a central line. Why do you think it's not given to a central line? Because a central line, it's not compressible. Might as well give it, for example, IV. Might as well give it like peripheral. Because at any time, it will bleed out. You can compress. If you're going to give it to a central line, for example, IJ or subclavian, you cannot compress. So you cannot prevent the bleeding. Again, this is an NCLEX tip for your thrombolytics. It's given, you know, not central line. Peripheral IV is fine, all right? 
So avoid uh, contraindications. There's lots of contraindications. For example, if you are, if you had surgery within two weeks, surgery within two weeks, we're almost done here. Surgery within two weeks, two weeks time. All right. If you have AV malformation, if you have aortic aneurysm, all right. Or let's just say aneurysm in many types, aneurysms. What else? Aortic aneurysm, if you are with a trauma, if you have trauma for the past three months, and who knows, you have some form of, you know, uh, bleeding in your brain. So let's just say head trauma, all right? Let's just say head trauma. So if you are, uh, if you had CVA, ischemic form for the past three months all right because who knows you already got your thrombolytics again you are very high risk for bleeding this is the severe risk uh, kind of category right so what else uh aortic aneurysm and uh let's just say aortic dissection as well right aortic dissection we're in the staring of your aorta so you're also high risk for bleeding. These are just some of the contraindications. Again, you cannot give your thrombolytics if you have these contraindications with you guys. All right. Before I move on to the general teachings to your blood thinners, generally, huh? generally. Okay. You forgot about my second word. I forgot about my second word. What's my first word? Inspiration. My second word for today is adversity. I should have related it to your, you know, uh, the, the time I said about pharmacology, which is kind of difficult, kind of difficult topic. But these are some of the adversities that we're encountering during our, you know, during our preparation. Right. However, you know, adversity always come. It always come, do, you know, during the middle of our struggle, during the middle of our journey, in every journey that we are encountering. Right. However. If you have adversities in your life, at the end of the day, we still do our best. We do our best shots. We do our best in order to surpass these adversities. Okay? So I'm telling you guys, please, even if it's difficult, even if it's challenging, as long as you do your best, we are made by the Almighty to have abilities to overcome these situations. All right? We are not, you know, forget my, I forgive my word. We're not dumb enough to, to, to not understand this kind of concepts because we learned it in college already. But again, like I said, at the end of the day, we do our best. Okay. We strive hard. We work hard because we want to get this journey. We want to get this success. That's the second word. I'm going to give you the last word later on. All right. So general teachings, blood thinners. Please avoid egos or egos, all right? And what is this? This is a mnemonic, guys. We're almost done. So your egos is vitamin E. Letter E stands for uh, vitamin E. Sorry, that's not vitamin K. Okay. So letter G is your ginkgo biloba, a memory enhancer. We have ginseng, all right? We have garlic and as well as what's the other one? garlic and your uh what else ginkgo biloba ginseng garlic and as well as your uh ginger all right how can i forget this the four g's the four g's these are herbal medications that causes bleeding so avoid ginkgo biloba avoid garlic and as well as avoid ginger again this will put your patient at risk for bleeding this is in general huh if you're taking blood thinners and lastly we have your omega-3 omega-3 avoid omega-3 as well i'm also gonna put your letter s letter s stands for saint john's wort saint john's wort is a medication for an herbal medication for depression so saint john's wort is also putting your patient at risk for bleeding so please take note of this medication so avoid egos or egos if you're taking any blood thinners all right of course i mentioned about labs in each you know specific you know blood thinners and the bleeding signs 
So, what are the bleeding signs? For example, in your neuro, okay, your patient might complain headache. That could be also a sign of bleeding, which is intracranial, which is more severe, of course, intracranial hemorrhage. What else? Your patient might experience nose bleeding, epistaxis. Your patient might experience gingival bleeding. Your patient might experience GI bleeding, upper GI bleed in a form of your coffee ground, you know, uh, vomit, vomitus, or in a form of your <clears throat> hematemesis, a fresh blood. And it could be a form of your lower GI bleeding, wherein your patient will poop fresh blood, hematochesia, or your uh, black tarry stool. These are the common things. These are nursing, really. And the patient might have bruising. Guys, bruising is just normal. All right? Again, bruising is normal. You don't panic if your patient is having bruising, if your patient is taking blood thinners. Did you understand? Okay. So again, the most common signs and symptoms of your bleeding that you can see from your patient, which is also common, uh, commonly asked in your NFLEX, are GI bleed. Okay? But whenever the patient feels having like abdominal pain, it doesn't mean that your patient is already having abdominal bleeding or GI bleeding. All right? Not unless if your patient is vomiting blood or having some coffee ground aspirate, upper GI, or lower GI, having some fresh blood or hematochesia or black tarry stool. That's a sign of bleeding. You need to report that to your physician. In other words, you need to hold your medication. All right? And you can also have hematuria. You can also have vaginal bleeding. These are the signs of your you know, bleeding that you need to inform your physician. Again, most commonly, your GI bleed. All right. And please avoid trauma. These are very common, you know, uh, NCLEX things. No contact sports. You have to increase fiber, fiber in your diet. Increase oral fluid intake. So as to avoid constipation because constipation can cause, if you have hemorrhoids there, it can cause uh, bleeding to your hemorrhoids and then you're taking blood thinners. You have to have a well-lit uh, holes because we don't want fall from our patients. We don't want injury, all right? Avoid fall as well. That's also a favorite in your NCLEX. Soft bristle toothbrush to avoid gingival bleeding. No flossing, please. No flossing. And lastly, I mean, uh, no razors. And bruising is also what? Bruising is also normal. Question mark, because bruising can be normal. Okay, unless if your patient is having active bleeding, and then that's a problem. No razors as well. Okay, no razors as well. Question. This is a kind of a critical thinking, guys. All right. Because some of the some of the uh, references that we have, we cannot combine blood thinners. Question. Can you combine blood thinners or not? Can you combine blood thinners or not? Can you? The answer is just yes or no. Yes or no. Can you combine blood thinners? Yes or no? Guys, come on. Can you combine blood thinners? For example, can you combine antiplatelet and as well as your anticoags? Okay. Can you? Is that okay? If your patient is having, for example, like DVT, which will lead or can lead to pulmonary embolism, and your patient is also having coronary artery disease, which is acute coronary syndrome, the patient is very high risk. Good. You can. You can. I was just soliciting your answer, guys. It's either yes or no. Okay? You can have, for example, in a, uh, in a uh, coronary artery disease patient. Depends upon your doctor's uh, you know, prerogative. But in general, huh, in general, what we do is as much as we can, we don't combine it. In a nursing perspective, right? If the patient is taking two medications at the same, two blood thinners at the same time, it has to be prescribed by the physician so it's still yes as long as it's prescribed by the physician especially if your patient is high risk to develop clots for example like having dvt recurrently at the same time the patient just had a heart attack your acute coronary syndrome they might get dual therapy of your antiplatelets for example getting aspirin and getting clopidogrel Plus the fact that this patient is also developing some form of acute coronary syndrome. 
because the patient is smoking, the patient is hypertensive, the patient is diabetic, etc., etc. High cholesterol. These are very high risk individuals. The doctor might add another anticoagulants. So an antiplatelet and anticoagulants can come, you know, together as long as it's prescribed by the physician. All right. Combining your heparin. Sorry, it's uh, it's a little bit slow. My, you know, my laptop. Because I'm using a different app, heparin and uh, uh, no, a different app for my drawing. Heparin at the same time your warfarin. This is what we call as bridging, right? So this is bridging from your warf uh, heparin, which is IV, and then became sub Q, and then bridging it to become PO. By the way, warfarin is a long-term kind of medication. Okay. So you're going to get it, uh, you know, long term. The problem in your warfarin is that, you know, too many like uh, 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 blood works like your INR. You need to monitor it. Okay. Can you give this one together? Yes. It can overlap to each other. Okay. Your warfarin works after five days. Okay. It works after five days. Okay, this is the problem with warfarin. It doesn't work immediately, unlike your rivaroxaban, unlike your uh, your, your uh, apixaban. So, be, right? Uh, remember, your apixaban, your rivaroxaban are alternates to your warfarin. It works immediately, unlike your warfarin, it works after five days. So, before your warfarin works, please keep your heparin for a period of five days. All right, for a period of five days. By that time. You understand what I'm saying here? By the time your warfarin is already working. And how do you know if it's already working? Of course, check for your PT and most importantly, your INR. If it's already therapeutic. As long as it's not more than, magic number is 3.5 seconds. Did you get that? All right, heparin and warfarin can go together. All right, so they can overlap to each other. All right, in five days time, you are able to see the warfarin is already working. How do you know? Check the INR level. As long as it's not, you know, more than three to five seconds, three point five seconds, you are good. Okay. Lastly, my word of uh, wisdom is above all spirituality. So, what's the number one thing? Inspiration, because we are motivated by our, you know, our. Uh, our inspiration why did we take this examination secondly is adversity along the way you will encounter some struggles during your review process you know talking about nclex all right but again you do your best all right and lastly is spirituality for you know what because everything is actually useless if you don't have a good spirituality if you don't have a good relationship to the man above all to the glory and honor to god and that's our lecture for today thank you guys any questions uh mr june said it depends upon the vte score that's really correct so uh, i that's a separate discussion in terms of indication but in general you can give it to like afib atrial fibrillation patients with valvular problems we have cva and many things uh, for example like acute coronary syndrome all right, so thank you, thank you for, for today. I extended uh, uh, 30 minutes. I did not expect, I was actually anticipating that I can extend due to some difficulties as well in, you know, in technicalities, but I was able to do it. We were able to do it. Thank you, thank you, and hope to see you guys in another, uh, in another free lecture. All right, and if you're a student in IPAS, I'll see you there. Our next cycle will be, uh, uh, will be soon. I guess it's uh, almost, uh, I mean, two weeks from now, I guess. So thank you, thank you. And thank you, Connetics, for giving us an opportunity to, again, to become an instrument, at least to help you guys, you know, achieve your goals, all right, together with the other uh, uh, review, uh, review centers. Thank you, and God bless everyone. Inspiration, adversity, spirituality. Takeaways, all right? <clears throat> thank you.